This program is brought to you by Emory University. We'll go ahead and get started. Uh, so it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker uh, today, John Sobranski, um, from uh, the Division of Pulmonary Critical Care Medicine and the Emory Center for Critical, Critical Care. Um, Dr. Sobranski, I've known for a long time, um, uh, graduated from Dartmouth, um, went to med school at George Washington, did residency at Columbia Presbyterian, then fellowships in pulmonary and critical care um, at NIH and Johns Hopkins. He was at Johns Hopkins, where I fir first met him as my attending in the Bayview ICU, um, now many years ago, and has been with Emory since uh, 2011. Um, we're really lucky to have him come and talk with us today about some really exciting uh, developments in sepsis management. So. Thank you, and I appreciate the invitation, and I appreciate people showing up for a non-cardiology talk during cardiology grand rounds. Um, the disclosures I need to mention are that the study I'm briefly going to talk about at the end is funded by the Marcus Foundation. I have some intellectual biases which will come out during the talk. And, and finally, um, you know, for those of you that are familiar with the grade classification, um, which is a way of looking at evidence, the first thing about anything that you talk about is that it's important you understand which patient population you're talking about. So when I start speaking about fluids, please recognize that I am not talking about patients admitted to the hospital with decompensated heart failure, just to avoid any interesting discussions at the, as I get further on in this talk. Again, when, when you look at evidence, you want to look at the evidence in the patient population in which it was studied. And I am not primarily going to be talking about the patient population, again, of people who are admitted to the hospital with decompensated heart failure. So in most ICUs, in, including the CCU, there's a, a cadre of patients um, who get admitted with infections. And um, the index case that's going to launch my, my talk is, is a patient that I saw a little over a year ago um, who, uh, as many patients who were admitted to Emory, had, um, had, had cancer, uh, CML, um, got a bone marrow transplant, was admitted with GVHD, and uh, two days after admitted, um, came to the ICU um, with um, hypotension, tachypnea, some chest pain, um, leukopenia, a high lactate, and relatively quickly grew uh, gram-positive, uh, gram-negative cocci in, in the bloodstream that, that turned out to be pseudomonas, um, and uh, was admitted to the ICU with an infection and organ failure. And, um, the infection, I think most people will, will recognize that the low white count, the high fever, um, goes with that. And the fact that they required the non-rebreather um, uh, suggested that they had a respiratory organ failure. <clears throat> I think most cardiologists would be comfortable with the idea that there are tr patients who needed to be treated rapidly. Um, but, but this actually was somewhat of a novel idea for medical intensivists. Um, and about 20 years ago, an emergency medicine doc named Manny Rivers, Emmanuel Rivers, um, suggested that, that we ought to treat patients with sepsis the same way that we treat patients with an acute MI, with strokes, with trauma, that, that, we, that it's a medical emergency and that the clock starts ticking when the patient presents. And again, this, this shouldn't be a, a a novel idea, but, but it was. And um, he highlighted the idea that, again, that you ought to treat people as rapidly as you treat people with trauma or with acute MIs. And the, the treatment, and I'll talk a little bit more about this, is much simpler than that for other diseases, which is you need to water the patient a little bit with some fluids, and you need to give antibiotics. And again, that this is a medical emergency and needs to be treated rapidly. So sepsis is common. You'll see it in 
almost throughout the hospital um, because of the fact that sick people are likely to get infected. Um, it's not something that we want for our patients, but many patients who are admitted to the hospital um, for other things end up getting infected. Um, there have been a number of different estimates on the number of cases per year, um, somewhere between one and three million cases in the U.S. every year. And, and I'm going to talk for a moment about why there's such a wide range. Um, people who get this die, and... Um, and again, there's, there's a time sensitivity to both identifying the patients and to treating the patients. It turns out to be the most expensive diagnosis, the most expensive DRG in the US for, for a wide variety of reasons. Um, the incidence of sepsis, and this is data that Greg Martin, uh, who is one of our faculty members primarily based at, at Grady, published maybe 15 years ago, showing that the uh, incidence is going up and the case fatality rate is probably going down, although there's some, um, th there's some disagreement as to whether it is or it isn't uh, going down. And when you look at who dies in the hospital, and, and what I'm showing here are some data from about 4 million patients admitted to Kaiser Permanente um, hospitals, uh, primarily in California, over about a decade, um, between a half and a third of all patients, again, depending on how you define sepsis, who die in the hospital seem to die from sepsis, either as a primary diagnosis or sepsis that's acquired in the hospital. And if you look at um, the uh, vital statistics, um, depending on how you define it, Obviously, heart disease is, is, is number one in the terms of the cause of, of deaths. Um, but most of the lower respiratory uh, diseases and influenza and pneumonia, both are the majority of those cases are people who have sepsis. And again, if you add them together, it's probably, it's probably the third uh, leading cause of death uh, in the U.S., I don't know if anybody recognizes this. It's one of the Rorschach blots. Um, and if you, see a, um, if you see a spider or a crab, you're in the majority. Um, that's what most people look at it. And, and the reason that I put this up is that sepsis is a syndrome. It's not a disease. We don't have a biomarker. And so you're stuck primarily with pattern recognition for identifying the patients. And really, the only difficult part about treating patients with sepsis is, is making the diagnosis, is saying, yes, this patient may have an infection, and I need to worry about it. And again, the, the biggest problem is that we don't have a diagnostic test. Lots of people have looked for diagnostic tests. and. Um, I could spend the next 40 minutes talking about diagnostic tests that are not useful, um, but to, to share you from that boardroom, I'll just say that we don't, we don't have a biomarker, even though lots of people have looked. And so we're stuck, again, with, with a constellation of signs and syndromes that leads to this. And this is the most recent uh, definition um, that, that came out of a consensus conference. Um, that sepsis is life-threatening dysregulation of organ function in response to an infection. That makes perfect sense, but, but how do you operationalize that? You know, how, how do you figure out what dysregulation of organ function is? Um, and maybe harder, how do you diagnose infection? You know, we're still using 19th century technology primarily to diagnose infections. We, we, we take up cultures and then we spread it on an agar plate and wait a couple days and see if something comes back. And while there are lots of fancy new techniques for diagnosing infections, some of which have fancy names like biofire that, that we, we have in this hospital, whether or not those are useful for diagnosing infections are, are not clear. So the old criteria for sepsis, the old definition, um, were the SIRS criteria, uh, which, which are on your left. And, and the problem with these is that they are, 
not specific at all, right? Somebody who's admitted to the, the hospital with heart failure and acute MI, alcohol withdrawal, um, lots of other things will, will meet two of those four criteria. And uh, as I mentioned, the evidence of infection isn't, isn't really useful. It's not specific. Um, and um, when looking at about four million patients, um, the group that came up with the new sepsis definition um, showed very nicely that, that the positive predictive value and the negative predictive value of, uh, of the SERS definition uh, was not great. Um, and uh, just as an example of this, um, uh, about three years ago, a group in Australia and New Zealand looked at a million patients admitted to the ICU, 100,000 of which had an infection and organ failure, and one in eight um, did not meet the SERS criteria. So not only were the SERS criteria not specific, but they weren't sensitive. You know, any diagnostic test that missed 12% of patients is probably not going to be great. So, so the new definition is, again, life-threatening organ dysfunction caused by a dysregulated host response to infection, and you need to have organ failure. And that's what we're stuck with. Again, it'd be a lot easier if we could draw a blood test, but we can't. Please feel free to stop me at any point. I'm, I'm, I'm glad to keep on talking. Um, but um, if, if there's something that somebody violently disagrees with or, or wants clarification, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to, to go ahead and chat. In 1954, um, an astute um, biochemist noticed um, that um, one of his, um, uh, one of his uh, um, horseshoe crabs that had accidentally been infected with Vibrio, um, that when, when they dissected the, the animal, it was completely, the, all the, the blood was coagulated. Um, and over a couple of years, they realized that, that you might actually be able to, uh, to diagnose um, whether or not there's uh, endotoxin in an organism um, by using um, this, this particular reaction um, this is a horseshoe crab, for those of you who've never been to an East Coast um, uh, beach. Um, and, um, and, and there's a, something that uh, evolution probably developed um, because if a, if a crab has, but there's lots of uh, gram-negative organisms in, in the sea, and if they, they had a breach of their shell, um, the, the blood in the horseshoe crab um, is, is sort of widely dispersed, and so being able to isolate um, the, 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 the uh, endotoxin turned out probably to be evolutionarily wise, a, a useful technique. And being able to identify the presence of endotoxin actually revolutionized figuring out what the pathophysiology of sepsis might be. And um, 30 years ago, um, in both some uh, human experiments, um, and, and that's uh, shown over here, um, showing that if, if you give an endotoxin challenge to a normal volunteer, the levels of tumor necrosis factor uh, go up and then come back down, which is, which is something that you'll see in sepsis. And Kevin Tracy, who was trained as a neurosurgeon um, in a large animal model, showed that if you pretreated the animal, um, with monoclonal antibodies to tumor necrosis factor um, to animals that were challenged with endotoxin, you could prevent the cardiovascular embarrassment that you get with sepsis, um, and you can improve mortality. And this led to thoughts, well, we've, we've cured sepsis, um, and, and led to um, lots of trials of things that now are very useful in treating rheumatoid arthritis and inflammatory bowel disease, um, but but don't work in treating sepsis. Um, and, and here's a listing of, of eight or nine studies that, that, that failed to show a benefit to, um, to giving monoclonal antibodies directed at tumor necrosis factor. And people tried to block lots and lots of different mediators um, that all came out of this, this fundamental discovery that, that endotoxin and tumor necrosis factor and interleukin-1 all got dysregulated with infections. But blocking this dysregulation 
turned out to be a spectacularly bad way at helping patients. And so fancy things, drugs that are $7,000 per dose, turned out not to be very useful in treating patients with infections. And more recently, uh, and I've just listed here, um, we've tried lots of fancy things. And, and all of these are, are high-impact journals um, with ends of greater than 1,000 patients, which for medical critical care studies are, are big trials. Um, and none of these have shown a beneficial treatment effect. So, so what, what do we have to treat patients with sepsis? Um, well, the, the toolbox is, is not full of a lot of things, but fortunately, we may not need a lot of things. So we need to recognize whether or not somebody's got infections. Um, once you recognize them, you need to have a door to infusion time of antibiotics that is short, and you need to measure how you're doing with infections, and that the, the measurement of your performance to, to improve outcomes should be familiar to, uh, to this group uh, as um, th those people who have similar hairstyles to me or, or, or more white hair will remember that we went through um, probably 15 or 20 years ago trying to improve uh, time to, uh, um, to uh, door to balloon time and as, as one of the mechanisms for, for improving outcomes in patients who are presenting with acute MIs. My son's a big hockey fan, and um, Geico is a, is a sponsor of, uh, of, of the National Hospital, uh, so the National Hockey uh, uh, League. And uh, about 10 years ago, they, they had a bunch of commercials where, the, where they had a, uh, where the tagline was, was uh, you know, this is so simple that even a caveman can, can do it. And, and I'd like to argue that once you identify a patient with sepsis, that, that the treatment is extraordinarily simple, that, that we don't need fancy things. We don't need brilliant clinicians to do this. We just need to implement the, 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 the problem. And, and, and I want to, I guess, use first an animal experiment um, that's about 30 years old, and, and then briefly talk about some data in humans that suggests that, that, that the tools are relatively simple. So, so this study um, w was done actually by my, my mentor at, at NIH, a guy named uh, Charles Natanson, about 30 years ago, um, in which he did a factorial design of cardiovascular support and antibiotics for animals that were infected. And the cardiovascular support consisted of fluids and vasopressors, and the antibiotics were antibiotics that were uh, effective against the, um, against the organism. And if you look at the um, survival curve, um, you'll notice that while if you just give antibiotics alone or um, no therapy, the animals died relatively quickly. But if you gave cardiovascular support, if you gave cardiovascular support, which again was fluids and vasopressors, the animals survived for a couple of days before dying. And then if you gave both of them, there was a synergistic effect. And really, the purpose of the supportive therapy is to buy time for the host defense system to work in conjunction with the antibiotics to allow the patient their best chance at survival. So I hope in the next three minutes that I can convince you that early antibiotics are effective. And perhaps the, the, the easiest thing to, or, or the, the best data, um, comes from a study that's, that's over a decade old in which Anand Kumar looked at a couple thousand patients <coughs> who developed septic shock in Canadian hospitals. And, and on your, your y-axis is the odds ratio for death. And on the x-axis is, uh, is time from the, the time that they developed hypotension. And, and I hope I, I can convince you that the longer it takes to get effective antibiotics, um, the, the, the higher the odds of death are. 
I hope that I, you don't need to be a statistician to understand this graph. But, but I also want to show you some more recent data. And um, this data comes out of New York State. And, and this actually comes out of a state-mandated um, performance improvement project. There was an 11-year-old boy who scraped his, his leg playing basketball um, and presented to um, three physicians um, over a 24-hour period of time. Um, one sent him home from a pediatric office. Another emergency room sent him home. And um, the, the third presentation uh, led to him being admitted to, to a pediatric ICU where, where he died of, of, of sepsis within 24 hours. And, and New York State did what New York State usually does when, when somebody who has um, political influence um, and has a bad outcome in a hospital. They, they legislated that all hospitals in, in New York need to have a sepsis treatment program. And, um, and so they mandated this. And, and this study, um, which was published a, a year ago in the New England Journal, followed the outcomes of patients. And uh, on your left, um, I hope I can convince you that when you look at the time to antibiotics, that the longer it takes to give antibiotics, the, the more likely the patient is to die. This is an association. It doesn't show causality, uh, which, which is the problem with, with any observational study. Um, but but um, this, uh, I, I hope, is um, strongly suggestive that giving antibiotics to patients with infections both makes sense and is associated with better outcomes. And what's clear from the New York State data is that not every patient gets the desired treatment. The other thing in our toolbox is to have protocols and pathways. Um, and um, briefly, I just showed you one, one pathway in New York State. Um, uh, about a decade ago in Spain, a quarter of the ICUs went through a relatively poorly designed performance improvement project. People showed up and they, they lectured to physicians, which as those of you who think about quality improvement, um, that, that's not a great way to change behavior. Um, but despite the fact that they didn't use a great methodology um, to, to change behavior, after they implemented this quality improvement project, mortality for sepsis in all of Spain actually went down um, by, by, by a substantial amount. Um, and uh, in Utah, which is run by, uh, all of the hospitals in Utah are run by Intermountain Healthcare. Um, and they decided in, in a similar time frame that they were going to improve their care of, of sepsis. And when they started out, about one in 20 patients got the desired care. By the time they ended out, three out of four um, had desired care. And the mortality rate from sepsis was cut in half. So, um, so I think most people would argue that having a sepsis pathway um, is important. And uh, again, the New York State data, when you look at following the bundle, um, the sepsis bundle, which includes giving broad spectrum antibiotics, giving fluids, and, um, and measuring a lactate, that time to completion of, the, of this pathway was associated with mortality in the hospital. I should briefly talk about fluids, because this is where most people give pushback. Um, and and I, I, I need to disclose that we don't have a great way at figuring out how much volume to give to somebody with an infection. Even if they don't have heart disease, we, we don't know how much to give. Um, you know, finding the not too much, not too little is really complicated. And if you ask 10 different physicians, you'll get 12 different answers in terms of how much is right. My guess about how much is right is two liters of fluid. And, and the reason that I have this guess is that um, last year, um, a group did an individual patient meta-analysis of the three largest trials of goal-directed therapy for sepsis. And so they looked at all of the patients. And in the usual care group, 
the median amount of fluids given was two liters. So in the absence of having better data, I would suggest that two liters is probably the right amount for your average patient. The, the problem is that most of our patients aren't average. But what we know is that not giving enough fluids is associated with worse outcomes. You'll get more likely to get lung injury. Um, you're more likely to die. And if you give too much fluids, um, the amount of fluids that you give is also associated with mortality. So, so I don't have a great answer. And I could, again, spend about 45 minutes talking about how bad our measures of, of filling, at least in sepsis patients, are. Um, but but I, I'd rather not uh, spend that time. The one other thing that we've gotten much better at right now, which again trails other fields, is that finally we've been able to engage the public. Um, and um, having people recognize that sepsis is a problem. Um, th this is uh, from... Uh, uh, there were a number of news headlines, and, and th this actually comes from the website of, uh, of a patient advocacy group um, highlighting the fact that, uh, that Muhammad Ali died of an aspiration pneumonia that was sepsis. Um, the Sepsis Alliance, which is another patient advocacy group, um, uh, suggests that people are sepsis smart. Um, and with all of the things that I've mentioned, we seem to be slowly improving the mortality rate from sepsis, even though we don't have a lot of things in our toolbox. So before I move on, I just want to make sure that nothing that I said um, gets people really upset, um, or that there's, there's nothing I've, I've said so far that, um, that is uh, um, uh, confusing or, or needs further clarification. I guess the, the thing that you talk about of recognizing sepsis, that to me seems to be a problem in itself. And it's a patient, it takes somebody in a position a while to recognize sepsis. You've lost time during that time. Uh, and then when you're talking about volume of fluid, how quick are you giving that two liters? So in, in the first hour or two hours. But, but you're, you're exactly right that the, the recognition is problematic. And uh, again, using using uh, uh, something from, from your own world. It's my understanding when, when they first started doing the, the, the time teams or, the, um, or, or the, the, the teams to activate the cath lab, that many of the emergency room physicians that partnered with, with, um, with, with uh, cardiologists would accept a one in 10 false positive rate for activation of the team, at least initially. Um, and when we screen, when we use screening tools to diagnose sepsis, um, our false positive rate is much, much higher. Now, fortunately, we don't have to bring people in from home to give antibiotics, right? So, so, so the downside of a false positive is, is, not, is not as large. Um, but our false positive rate is, is up to, uh, you know, up to 100% in, in some of the studies. And that's really the biggest challenge is where do you set that, that level? Do, do you activate um, the, the, um, the, the sepsis team more frequently and then worry about you know, a, alarm fatigue? Or, or are you willing to miss some patients? And, and so that's been a, a complicated part right now that, that I'm not sure we've gotten right yet. There's a clue, the big clue we have with an acute infarct is SPL and that triggers everything. But if you don't have that, you might eventually, there'll be a delay in, in getting them into the lab. But the SP elevation, and that's what I, I look to me like you're missing with sepsis. Is that one thing you say, this is this? Yes. We, we, we don't have a good marker. And we, we've got a lot of bad markers. Procalcitonin is the most recent one that's gotten a lot of press. And it, it, it turns out to be spectacularly bad at both ruling in and ruling out infection. It's good for stopping antibiotics at the end, but it's not good for, for figuring out whether you ought to start them or, or not. So, so we don't, when we look at our, in our pockets, we, we, we don't really have anything great. So, so are, we, are we on health data? Water? Water? So I would say uh, 
as Doug says, in our patients on the floor right here or in the unit. Is this working all right? Yeah. Uh, we miss it a lot. And when you diagnose it by the blood cultures coming back positive, then you really have missed it. So the, the time of recognition to to starting the antibiotics is one thing, and another thing that we don't pay any attention to is when the antibiotics get started. And I think you have to walk off the floor talking to the nurse to say, we've got to have these antibiotics quickly. They can't, they can't wait three hours to get the antibiotics. I mean, you need a dose of antibiotics, and just like you say. And uh, oftentimes, the clue to sepsis is like altered mental status. And, uh, we start calling the neurologist and all that. So there, there's a big gap there in identification, at least for us cardiologists out here on this floor in these units. So uh, you have to think of it quickly, and then you have to go to the second step, is get the antibiotics and go. And if you just walk off and come back and say, well, the antibiotics been given? Uh, three hours later, they haven't been given. So, well, we, we missed the boat there. This critical time there. Thank you for, for, for that point. In, in, in fact, you're exactly right that, that doing what we say that we're, we should do is, is sometimes more challenging than you think. And maybe the best example I could, I could give is that when that, when that article uh, came out, the, the first one by Kumar showing that there was, for every hour in delay um, uh, in antibiotics, um, that, uh, um, that there was an incremental mortality to this. And I figured that uh, at that point, the, the ICU that I was working in then, that we, we thought a lot about sepsis. Um, a number of us did, did research in, in, in sepsis. And we were sure that we were really good about delivering those antibiotics quickly. And, and we, we measured it. And it turned out that, uh, you know, that, that, that we were not as good as we thought we were. And, and this was in an ICU that, that had antibiotics in, in, the, in the Pixis system. And, and all that it really required was, was telling the nurse. And, and that turned out to be the biggest problem, was that, that the, the team did not actually walk over in, in, the, in the era of, of computer order entry and actually tell the nurse, this is important. Please give the antibiotics. And, and once we did that, our, our time to, to, uh, to antibiotic delivery got, got much better. So I want to end um, by, by briefly talking about a trial that, that you probably won't see in your ICU, um, but um, unless there's a non-cardiology patient who, who gets admitted there, which, which, as I understand, sometimes happens. Um, uh, but, but we will be doing at Emory and at 30 other sites. Um, and, and the reason we're doing this, this trial is that a, a little over a year ago, a very opinionated physician named Paul Marek um, at East Virginia uh, Medical uh, College um, showed a, a study um, that compared um, uh, just under 80 patients who were treated with um, hydrocortisone, vitamin C, and thiamine for, for sepsis um, and showed a 32% absolute risk reduction in mortality. Um, from 40% to 8% in mortality. Um, I'm not sure antibiotics by themselves cause th this much of a risk reduction in mortality, but, but showed this, this incredibly large uh, um, uh, mortality reduction. And, and this was, um, it hit the national news. Uh, he was on NPR. Um, some physicians for Emory also were on NPR. Um, and. Uh, Lots of people changed practice based on this single center before and after study using historical controls that were risk adjusted, which usually doesn't change practice in most things. Um, and so lots of people started using it, and lots of people said that this really isn't the type of data that, that changes practice. Um, and uh, uh, there was a lot of intellectual discourse, but there was also a lot of um, non-polite discourse. Um, and, and there is some biologic rationale for, um, for, for using vitamin C in infected patients. It, um, it, it can modulate uh, inflammation. 
Um, it's, it's necessary for the synthesis of, of endogenous catecholamines, um, and it's, uh, it's, it's necessary for, for maintaining your, your tight junctions and your microcirculation. And thymine um, also can prevent some of the complications of, of giving vitamin C, um, which is, which is ox oxalic acid crystals in, in the kidney. And there is some data suggesting that hydrocortisone um, uh, can potentiate the effect of vitamin C, which is why there is this triple therapy that's been prescribed. And among the people that listened to the, the NPR um, uh, broadcast was a, was a funding agency. Um, and they were uh, gracious enough to, uh, to fund uh, us um, as a partnership between uh, emergency medicine um, and, um, and critical care um, to, uh, to do a study looking at vitamin C, thymine, and steroids and sepsis, um, comparing usual care um, with, uh, with, with giving this triple therapy, um, looking at two, more ta two endpoints, uh, um, mortality, and um, um, vasopressor and ventilator-free days, or speed of recovery, um, as you will. Um, we're going to be enrolling uh, patients who are older than 18, um, who have infection as, as um, uh, sending off blood cultures and giving antibiotics, who either require vasopressor support or high-level respiratory support. And it's an adaptive design. I, I don't want to spend a large amount of time talking about it. Um, but um, early on, we're just looking at mortality um, because um, the, the funder is very interested in seeing whether or not the similar effect size um, that was, was seen, by, uh, seen in the, in the uh, retrospective study might be, might be uh, available in, in a prospective randomized controlled trial. If that doesn't happen, um, then we are, we are uh, going to be doing a more complicated um, study, again, looking at uh, organ failure-free days. Um, and if we show organ failure-free days, we're also going to look uh, to see whether or not we, we have a mortality effect, since mortality usually drives um, uh, changing uh, physician uh, behavior. Um, and uh, <clears throat> the, the study was funded by a contract. We have two years to complete this. Um, ideally, will be we have IRB approval at a, um, a common IRB at, at uh, Hopkins. Um, it's been posted on clinicaltrials.gov, um, and uh, we hopefully will enroll our first patient within the next month or so. Um, there are going to be roughly 30 sites, up to about 40 sites, um, and we've been funded for 500 patients with, with the possibility of going up to 2,000 patients and uh, have a lot of smart people, both at Emory and elsewhere, helping us think about how to design the study. Um, so it's possible that we might have a, uh, uh, another treatment. Um, history so far has not shown any benefit to modulating inflammation in any way, shape, or form. Um, we, we don't have any drugs that have worked in that pathway, um, but in theory, uh, Vitamins are, are cheap. Um, they don't have a lot of side effects, um, except for, for developing kidney stones. And so if this is, um, if it does work, it, it's likely something that's not going to be hard to implement. So I appreciate uh, the, the time, and uh, I'll be glad to answer any other questions you might have. So thanks very much. I'll, I'll uh, uh, ask a first question. So um, maybe you could tell us just a little bit more about kind of inclusion criteria other than the, this, just this kind of organ dysfunction or, or hypotension requiring pressures or, or respiratory requirement. Are there, are there, as we think about people particularly from, um, obviously this will not mostly be a CCU kind of population, but there may be a lot of people that would be on our general cardiology service that if they became septic would be eligible for a trial like that. I guess, um, could you tell us a little bit about kind of the both inclusion and exclusion criteria as well as the, the kind of flow of how this will work in the hospital? Sure. So thanks. Um, we've designed this to be as pragmatic as we can for a, for a study that, uh, that uh, again, 
in a patient population that doesn't have a biomarker. Um, so um, if a blood culture is sent off um, and antibiotics are given, um, you are eligible. Um, we don't have many exclusion criteria other than that if the physician thinks that the patient is likely to die of something else within the next six months, that's really our, our primary exclusion criteria. Um, but um, the, the other, I, I guess the, there are some minor exclusion criteria. So if you're not going to accept either vasopressors or uh, high-level respiratory support, which are our endpoints, um, you, you, we obviously wouldn't want to enroll them since, since those are our, our endpoints. And finally, if you develop one of the endpoints first from another cause, so if somebody comes in with cardiogenic shock or somebody's on a ventilator for another reason, we, we, we wouldn't <laughs> want to enroll them. Are they enrolled after they arrive in the ICU? They can be enrolled anywhere in the hospital. But they have to be go, they have to go to an ICU since it's hard to give um, three drugs every six hours on the floor. Be heading for an ICU. I was just uh, interested in the design of the trial a little bit more. The treatment groups, I'm, I'm unclear as to what the uh, what what the treatments are, and also uh, in, in retrospect, uh, some of them will be culture positive, I guess, and some not. And uh, will there be a sub analysis to try to understand whether you're actually treating sepsis or not? So, so thank you. Those are wonderful questions. To to answer the second one first, we are not going to look at whether people are culture positive or negative, since that in the past. In, in the last 30 years worth of, uh, of sepsis trials has not led to fruitful, um, uh, fruitful subgroups. Um, so, so we're not going to look at that. Um, our, our own experience, and I think others' experience, is that usually if people say somebody has sepsis, um, they, they do. Um, but, but this is obviously something that the Clinical Coordinating Center will, will be monitoring uh, relatively, uh, relatively closely to make sure that, that people are enrolled, um, are, are enrolled um, uh, appropriately. Um, in terms of the, the, the study, um, so people are getting vitamin C, thiamine, and corticosteroids because that's what was studied in, in the, the um, in the before and after study that, that received a lot of press. The, the complicating part of this is that many clinicians now give steroids for refractory shock from sepsis. And so we spent about three months um, trying to decide what we were going to do if the enrolling clinician felt that their patient needed um, steroids. And we, we've, uh, after a lot of discussion, agreed to allow those patients into the study. And if somebody gets steroids, um, we will stop the third infusion, which will either be steroids or placebo. This may bias the study towards the null, because if steroids are important um, and people in both groups get steroids, um, it makes it less likely that we'll see an effect. But we didn't think that we'd be able to uh, enroll patients if, if we said either everybody needed to get them or, or nobody would get them. Yeah, I, I just, I'm sorry I missed the beginning of the talk. I was seeing a patient in the unit who doesn't have sepsis but has cardiogenic shock. But um, I mean, I think that I want to applaud you for, for doing this, you know, taking this on, right? Because these sort of retrospective observations are frequently seen and, and you even though I missed the beginning of your talk, the, the complexity of making the diagnosis here, and then the timing is, is really, really challenging for randomization. And it was kind of brought up um, just the spectrum of diseases or disease states that can result in a sepsis type picture. Um, and then the fact that your therapy is for three different drugs uh, and the relative merit of each one is hard to tease out. And then the endpoints as well, 
the nice, th I mean, the, the thing with mortality is that it, it's crisp, but depending on your underlying disease process, the mortality could be driven by a number of different things. So this is one of those cases where you take on the randomized trial, uh, acknowledging up front that it, it may be pretty challenging. But, but I think the and you guys have thought about the trial design, the idea of looking at some pre-specified subgroups. The question is, are there, is there any harm in looking at a couple of pre-specified subgroups? Because you, if you end up doing all this and you come out negative, then it's a question of whether your entry criteria were selective enough and whether your endpoints were appropriate. So I'm sure you guys have put a lot of thought into that. But it's... It's a big undertaking, and I, I wish you the best. Well, thank you. The, you've, you've highlighted a number of the things that, that, that took a, a large group a long time to, to, to wend our way through. And one of the things originally we thought we might do, since there are a lot of advantages with adaptive designs, if you want to unpack a triple therapy, um, we, we initially thought that we might be able to, if the therapy works, start unpacking it and you can then use a, a strategy like play the winner and, and start randomizing to two of the three. Um, the, the problem with doing this is that it increases your sample size tremendously. And when we, we had discussions with the funder about doing this, um, they did not want to spend $100 million to, uh, to uh, allow us to complete that trial, which is, is, is not, not surprising, even though intellectually, that had we had unlimited funding and unlimited time, that that's probably how we would have designed it. Just to follow up on that is uh, what you're saying is you will randomize them to triple therapy and none of the none of the three. Is that right? Yes. And just with antibiotics, and the decision is made once somebody comes in, a member of your team, I'm sure, and makes declares this is infection, this is sepsis. The ball starts rolling. Is that right? Whether they've had antibiotic, I mean, whether they've had culture positive or culture negative. Correct. If 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 they've been given antibiotics and they've had blood cultures sent and they've got organ failure, um, all of which you can see by looking at the chart in terms of ease of screening, and you can look at the patient <coughs> and if they're on if they're on a ventilator or they're on vasopressors, you can tell that from the the beginning of the you know from the from the outside of the room. There are a lot of studies that use more complicated metrics, the severity of illness scores and other things, and those are much more complicated to operationalize, and, and that's one of the reasons since, for us, this is a relatively large study, um, even though I know that there are 40,000 patient cardiology studies, but be, because of, of the, the difficulty of, of getting the right patient, um, uh, you know, when you get above a couple hundred patients for a, for a medically critically ill patient, it becomes complicated, and we want it to be simple to, to enroll. Thank you. I was just going to say that uh, I think even the cardiology literature, the reason there aren't too many trials in cardiogenic shock and cardiac arrest is because of the complexity you're taking on. So really huge kudos, and, you know, we'd love to be any part of it. And it seems like, you know, just tr trying to guess from other studies that your chance of getting a good yield is pretty, probably pretty good. Uh, just think about this there, I'm trying to think about the informed consent. You know, it says, you know, you're, you're, you are your, your, your mother, somebody's in shock, and, uh, and uh, we've got this thing, it's some vitamins and some steroids, and we'll either give it or not, we don't know if it works. I, I'm making up the consent form, but but it seems like you, you know you should get a good good yield from such a thing. Fortunately, the the idea of vitamins is is attractive to many people, <laughs> and so I compared with some other studies that we we've done more complicated things. We we are hopeful, although the the proof will will come with, with our recruitment, since we have a very very aggressive um, uh, recruitment uh, um, timeline. But but I'm hoping that, that people will will be uh, more disposed to say yes. I'm willing to get some vitamins to see if it will get me better, rather than something that's that's harder to explain. I think the experience from the heart studies is that you need to focus on the time. I mean that was so critical, and all that is if you can't focus on it, everybody was tracking the time. That's Just the inclusion criteria. Okay, and the, the we're, we're fortunate again. This is a partnership between emergency medicine and the uh, 
and, and, and critical care. And we have some, uh, especially at Emory, but at some of the other sites, we have a very um, aggressive uh, emergency medicine. The, the David Wright, who's, who's head of the, um, uh, uh, I'll get his title wrong, but does a lot of neuro uh, um, emergency research, has, has 24-7 um, um, uh, uh, coordinators who, who are available for recruitment. And so we, we think that will, that will help. We're, we're one site of, of, of 30, and, you know, but, but we are hopeful that, that some of the other sites that, that we will uh, um, be uh, selecting will also have, um, have uh, you know, the, the capability to, to identify the patients early on and to, and to uh, enroll them relatively early on. Two, two really quick questions. So, so one is, what's the time course within which the therapy needs to be delivered? I think you, you had mentioned that, but I mean, I... So 24 hours after you okay. meet criteria um, is, is the time course um, that, 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 that we need to deliver the first dose of drug. Okay. And I guess the, the second one is, I know from prior conversations with you, this, this is, has been an interesting question. What, what do you imagine is going to be the distribution of patients? Do you think most of these folks are going to come from the emergency department, or do you think it's going to be a, a sort of healthy mix of inpatients and emergency department? So I don't know what the distribution will be. We, we, we suspect that it will probably be half and half, um, since statistically that's where half people develop sepsis in the hospital when they've presented with, with something else, and half of them present directly from the emergency room. So, so that would be my, my supposition. My guess is we may get a, because of, at, at Emory, we may have more emergency room patients, uh, certainly at Grady and, and, and here, just because of the people who are screening. Um, but uh, um, other sites may not, may not have as robust a, a, a screening apparatus. Great. Well, thank you very much for coming to talk to us and certainly let us know if there's ways we can be helpful in facilitating this. Thank you. Thanks. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.